Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Real Estate Happy Hour weekly podcast and video. Listen, no matter where you watch this, whether it's on YouTube or listen to it in your car on your podcast, make sure you give me five star or a thumbs up. Subscribe to it if you'd like. That's how we get the algorithms going and make sure that people um, hear what I have to say. If you don't like me, you think I suck, then give me a five star for effort. Give me a thumbs up for effort. Just because, listen, I'm brave. I'm putting it out there in the airwaves. All right. Today, we have a very, very big show, an important show. I don't have any guests, so I'm going to talk about two important topics that I've been wanting to get to. I found out through surveys and polls that I'm a very, very untrusted person. People don't like my profession. People don't like what we do. It's all over the news. There's been lawsuits filed, the whole nine, and they just think real estate agents aren't worth the money. Then number two is I'm going to get very vulnerable. I'm going to talk about my past financial woes. I'm going to talk about how I got myself in trouble a few times in financing. And now I'm at an age, thank God I finally got there, better late than never, I'm going to talk about how I was able to rethink, refocus, and fix my finances. All that when we come back. Thank you for watching. This is the Real Estate Happy Hour, and I'm your host, Chris Wright. It's a fun place where we talk real estate, pop culture, and what's trending. Hey, I might even give you some good advice, so grab yourself a drink, Sit back, relax, and take a listen. Unless you're driving, of course. I'll see you guys on the other side. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back um, to talk about those topics that I discussed in my intro. Um, So... Before we start, if you are sitting down watching this on YouTube, feel free to grab a drink. I'm drinking rum again today, just sipping on it. You never, you'll never see me get drunk on this podcast, but it is happy hour. And um, that's why I call it the happy hour, because I want you to be able to relax, have a beer. If you don't drink or you're um, recovering from substance abuse or alcohol, then go ahead and uh, grab a soda or a soft drink or water. All right. So I, I started... Uh, by talking about um, what's been in in the news lately lately discussing realtors and real estate agents. Um, It's been a fire starter topic and some real estate agents are really, really worried about it. There was a lawsuit. Um, National Association of Realtors are involved in this as well as some major brokers. And uh, there are people out there who think that uh, real estate agents, particularly buyers agents, just aren't worth the money they make. And I also also saw a poll online and it talked about the most trusted and untrusted or least trusted professions in America. Like we are on the least trusted list with jobs like paparazzi and bankers and journalists, debt collectors, um, lawyers, Lobbyists, even politicians, real estate agents are like just a tier above politicians. And we know that no one (laughs) really trusts politicians today. So all you need to do is just Google least trusted professions. And I don't care what the source is. Real estate agents will pop up on there. And I don't understand why Um, we work under a code of ethics. Um, The National Association of Realtors give us a guideline that we have to follow. We could be fined heavily. Um, But even if it's not, even if it's more than distrust, it's also about value and what you think I do um, is worth the money that you pay. So um, here's a paragraph. It says real estate agents are one of the most hated jobs around the world. It is just something about real estate agents, which makes them hard to trust. Um, As we go along this list of respected jobs and most untrustworthy professions in the world, notice how many professions end up on this list, which involves salespeople of various kinds, and that includes real estate agents. So let me explain something to you that you might not know. And if you do, good. 
There's over 2 million licensed real estate agents in the United States. And 1.5 of those real estate agents are realtors. Realtors and real estate agents aren't necessarily the same thing. If you're a realtor, that means that you fall under the code of ethics and practices of the National Association of Realtors. Big difference. We have boundaries. We have got guardrails, so to speak, that we have to follow. Otherwise, we could lose our privilege to work under the uh, National Association of Realtors, otherwise known as NAR. And in our state, which is New York, it's called NISAR. And then in my local area, it's called GCAR. All right. All of those acronyms do mean something to realtors, but may not mean something for the general public. But what it does mean is that there are codes, there are rules, there are boundaries, there are guidelines that can quickly, in an instant, cause us to lose our license. So many of us actually work in a space of trust meaning we have to do things to make the public trust us or we can be reported. It will be investigated. You know, there will be hearings about it and they will decide whether or not we get to keep our license. So I wanted you to know that their real estate agents and realtors are not one and the same. All right. Far as the salary and the pay goes, because people think that we, we walk around in skinny pants and fancy suits and drive fancy cars and live in nice houses. The average full-time realtor earnings last year was $32,000. $32, and that's if they, if they averaged a 40-hour week. A large percentage, is, a percentage of realtors only work part-time. They do it in the evenings. They may do it on the weekends. Some of them have full-time jobs. So I wanted to let you know that the average salary, $32,000, that's got to be one of, on average, one of the lowest paying jobs in America, All right? As a realtor, we do not get paid an hourly wage or salary. We are fired or we are unemployed after our last transaction. <clears throat> All right, so please understand that all the work that we do that encompasses our job, we're not getting paid for. You could work for someone with someone for days, weeks, or months with no guarantee. And there's never a guarantee that a sale's ever going to be made. That person could work with you. You could show them 40 homes and they just ghost you and decide, Maybe now is not the right time. And guess what? For all that time and effort, we do not get paid. So we wake up each day unemployed. So there's been a post on Facebook that realtors have been circulating and sharing and pasting and reposting. And a post to me just, instead of me just copying and pasting and reposting it, a lot of what I'm going to say comes from that post. So you, because I know you're not going to read it. You guys like small paragraphs and short sentences, and um, there's no way you're going to read all that. You know who read it was other realtors. So, um, but it's also just, it put a magnifying glass on the fact that we spend a lot of time away from our families in the evenings, on weekends, we're missing our kids, sports, you know, sports games and soccer and softball because we're out doing showings. We spend lots of money on uh, weekends on gas, um, other expenses. Many realtors rarely take vacations, if ever. So, and I'm not belly aching here because <laughs> I believe there is a space for us, whether a large percentage of people trust us or want to work with us or not. I'll give you an analogy like this. I can clean my own house, but that doesn't mean that there is not a space for housekeepers. There are people out there who appreciate that, who go, oh, my God, I don't have the time in my life to clean my house. And they hire housekeepers. Will we have a smaller audience over time of people that we use real estate agents? Of course. But just be good at what you do. Show your value and people will hire you to help them find a home. I'm confident in that. And I'm confident in what I do. And I know that I am able to help a large percentage of people, and those people will in turn appreciate what I bring to the table. 
All right. But real estate agents, we're on 24 seven. We don't turn our phones off. We get text alerts. We get phone calls. People call us at night when they're finally home from work. Seven, eight, nine. I even got a call the other night at 10 o'clock. I looked at the number and I had to debate whether I was going to answer it because I had a long day. But I recognized the number as one of my customers and I picked it up and I got myself together and I was like, hey, Joey, how you doing? Hey, Chris, sorry for calling you so late. And we had a conversation 24 seven. Sometimes we are we are even at our kids sporting events and we are answering text phone calls. Sometimes we have our laptops open with our hotspots going and we are talking to our clients and customers that way as well. Because if you're not on 24 seven, you may miss the one opportunity for sale in months. So keep, just keep that in mind, you know, and that large commission that you feel that you're paying, we're splitting that between cooperating agents. There's also a lot of expenses that we have to pay up front and after the sale. And um, I'm not going to go through the long list, but we, we do have broker fees that we have to pay. We have to pay our brokers. Sometimes we pay for office space. We pay for rent. We have to pay MLS fees in order to look for houses or even send you alerts about houses that are on the market. <clears throat> we have to pay National Association of Realtors fees and dues, our local association fees. There's ENO or um, insurance is, is what it is. Business insurance, auto insurance, self-employment taxes. The list is just long. And that's before we even list one house. Because once we list a house, there's website fees, there's um, the, the showing services fees that we have to pay, yard signs, we pay photographers, videographers, drone footage, office supplies, business cards, and we have to do continuing education so that we continue to do our job. I already talked about gas. I, 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 one thing I didn't talk about is income taxes, just like you, I have to pay taxes. Usually 30% of everything I make goes towards taxes. And then don't forget, if we are the breadwinners of our family and our spouses do not have a full-time job, then we may even have to pay for health insurance, which is huge for self-employed people. Uh, we also have to like, you know, prepare listings for presentation, talk to you about how to stage your, your listing, um, determine average days on market, got to get to know your home, know the market, know the demographics, understand the tax codes, insurance is just so much involved. But there is like an infinite list and in task of things that we do as real estate agents. And yet, after all of that that we do, we're still on the list of least trusted professionals. I don't understand it, but it is what it is. I mean, we don't even talk about the fact that we send out mailers, thank you cards, keeping in touch with our customers. You know, we, we, we help court, uh, owners coordinate their showings. We keep them in the loop about what's going on after their house is under contract. And if we're working with a buyer, we have to keep them posted on new properties that are coming on the market, making time to meet with them when it's convenient for them, sending them comps and you know, comparable market, marketing analysis on properties. We negotiate the offers for them. There's like just so many things, hundreds of things that we do as real estate agents. And yet we are still one of the least trusted professionals. If you feel that way, I would love for you to put in the comments why you don't trust or don't like real estate agents and why you don't think we're worth the money. Because I'm going to tell you, if the perception is that we make a ton of money because we wear fancy suits and skinny pants, I keep saying skinny pants because every time I go to like a national event or some type of uh, conference or something, I, I see a lot of uh, young and I'm probably I'm probably teasing some of the Gen Zers, <clears throat> but uh, they wear skinny pants a lot and shiny shoes. I don't dress like that. I dress like you see I am now. I don't feel I need to dress up to show that I'm a professional. 
I just have to look presentable and neat, clean and ensure I don't smell anyway. Um, but anyway, there is so much that we do as real estate agents that if you want to know, just ask one, say, what do you do? I'm sure a real estate agent will sit down with you at the kitchen table and explain what our jobs are. So again, I'm not belly aching over it. I don't care what the courts decide. I still think that I will have a job. I may not even make as much as I make now doing it, but I know that I have a large enough database or what we would call list of contacts that have referred me to their family and their friends that I can remain working for a very long time. So I just wanted to get that out there that I want you to rethink um, how you feel about real estate agents. And there's a saying by the Masons and it says to be one, ask one. Well, if you feel that way about real estate agents, you should ask one. There are a lot of people who have the same feeling about a turn. I sold cars too, by the way. And the way people feel about car salesmen, that wasn't me. I was the same way. It takes a large amount of emotional intelligence, understanding family needs, researching things for customers. If you are a bad real estate agent and people don't trust you, that's a personality defect. It has nothing to do with the profession. And no, we don't try to force people into homes that's not good for them or that they don't want. Ask any one of my customers or clients, and they will tell you when they said no, I said no. If they said not for me, I go, then I guess that's not for you. And I'm not trying, I did not try and push them into a home because I wanted to get rid of them or because I needed the sale. If I was that desperate, I would definitely 100% find a new profession. I promise you. So yeah, that's what's out there. If you want to know more about it, just Google real estate agent lawsuit or, you know, NAR and National Association of Realtors or lawsuits against, you know, some of the major brokers in the country and you'll find out what's going on. But it has a lot to do with our commission and how we're paid. Okay. All right. So my next topic that I wanted to get to um, is more about me. And I'm going to be very vulnerable, as I said. I'm going to be very transparent. Um, and some of this hurts a little bit to relive. But I think that what I'm going to tell you might save you some angst and stress and help with your mental health as it is today. So <clears throat> I grew up in a very matriarchal society, inner city Philadelphia, the hood, very low income, very poor, but we didn't know we were poor. We were what we call happy poor, where as a child, you don't know you're poor because your parents just provide you with whatever you need. Um, you go to school fairly decent with clothing. Um, and then the rest of the community is just like you. So you don't feel any different, not until you start to get older. Um, but yep, yeah, by today's standards, we would be considered poor. I grew up in a community that was primarily mothers, absent fathers, um, single family homes. Um, and I had a father. Um, I grew up with my father, actually. May he rest in peace. <clears throat> so I was a little bit different. I was one of the few kids in my neighborhood on my street that had a father that was present. That says a lot about um, society and where we were at that time. But I think um, with education and, and you know, knowledge, we're progressing <clears throat> as a culture, as a race, as, 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 a, as a people. But my father worked day to day. Um, he, we detailed cars. He was a cook. Um, he had jobs, but none of them was, is what I would call a career. <clears throat> he owned his own restaurant a few times. I worked in those restaurants. But my mother had a job job, as we would call. My mother had a career. She worked for the Department of the Navy. Um, and a lot of the women in my family had jobs, real jobs like that. But my dad was a hustler. You know, he was a guy who he didn't really like working for other people. So he always had hustles. 
<clears throat> and he had multiple hustles. So my neighborhood had a lot of substance abuse, alcoholism, gang violence. Um, and one thing about us all, the one thing we had in common is that, you know, we wanted nice things, just like everybody else in society. Everybody in America wants nice things, but we didn't know how to get them. Um, that's why there's so much crime in the inner cities, in the poor sections. Um, we did not have the tools, knowledge, or education to obtain them. That's just pure. I'm not making excuses. That's just the way it was. I heard a girl say on a TED Talk, <clears throat> She said, when people hear the word privilege, they associate with associate that with the concept of gain. And technically, that's kind of true you know, in most cases, in a lot of cases. But in a broader scope, the word privilege is more equivalent to the concept of a blinder, meaning the more privilege you have, the less you see. Digest that for a minute while I take a sip. The less privilege you, the less privilege you have, the more you bear witness to oppression, poverty, lacking and wanting and suffering and in all the problems of the world. But the more privilege you have, the less you see. And I experienced that in my own life because the further and further I got away from my beginnings, the less I understood as time went on, what was going on back in my community that I grew up in, what was going on in my hood. And that's where people can call you a sellout or you're whitewashed or you live out there in the burbs or whatever. And you just don't know what's going on in the hood, but I grew up in it. So I do know what's going on. It's either gotten better or it's gotten worse. I don't know because I removed myself from that as every person should want, but it is good to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. All right, but I sought out to be better. My family used to tell me, I'm one of nine children, <clears throat> and my brothers and sisters used to tell me as I got older, you think you're better than us. You think you're a better person. No, that was the goal, but it didn't make me better because I came from the same soil that you did. So although I sought out to be better and dress better and get a better job, I was still cut from the same cloth. So I was going to have some of the same problems only at a bigger, a larger scale. As the Notorious B.I.G. said, more money, more problems. Just because you start to make money, it doesn't mean that you're going to be better. It just means that your problems are bigger. And then you're the same person. You know, you can take the boy out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out of the boy. And sometimes that manifests itself in our education. And it manifests our, itself in our knowledge and when we speak and how we handle adult situations. But I did. I had a desire to be better than my family and my neighbors and my community. I wanted out and I wanted out whole full stop. I ran into the United States Navy in order to do that. But really, I had no idea how to remove myself from my hood totally other than through movies and television and wanting to emulate some of the characters that I'd seen. But no one taught me that. I didn't have a mentor. Um, I had no life coach. Those things didn't even exist when I was young. There was no one to hold my hand and show me an example. My father was a hustler. He made money day to day, whether it was running numbers or you might not know what running numbers is, but look it up. Look it up. <clears throat> Whether it was cooking, working side jobs and restaurants. Like I said, my first job as 11 or 12 years old, 12 year old was helping him detail cars out in the big parking lot. And we went home every day with 40, you know, with 150 bucks or whatever it was. I watched my dad work every single day, sun up to sundown to not make ends meet to not be able to buy oil for the house in the winter, to not have hot water sometimes. I came home more than once to a lock on the door from the tax collector because taxes weren't paid or an eviction notice. If you ever saw the movie Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith, that kid, that was me, only I was a little bit older. 
my father resorted to asking friends and family, hey, can you take Chris in? Um, I need to work some things out because he didn't have a home for me. And he went to stay with a friend and I went to stay with some friends or friends of his. I was essentially homeless. I think if, if Child Protective Services had found out how I was living, I would have been in foster care. My saving grace was having a big family because I always had an older brother and sister to live with or my mom could stay there. But my dad, he was too proud. He didn't want to ask family, so he asked friends. I survived through the grace of God and the generosity of family and community. And as I said, so that that life, looking for a better life and seeking out a better life or escaping from my hood, I ran into the United States Navy. Now, let's talk about the finances of that. So when you go into the Navy, you get guaranteed pay on the 1st and the 15th, right? It's a pretty nice chunk of cash for those, someone who grew up poor, someone who didn't grow up with means, and of course, for someone who wants nice things. And then for a teenager, it kind of makes you feel grown up because a lot of people, we go into the military at 18, 19 years old, sometimes 17. And once you start getting those checks on a biweekly basis, on the 1st and 15th, you realize I don't have to answer to a parent on what I do with my money. I don't have to answer to anyone. I get it all to myself and I can buy nice things. I can get an apartment if I want. I can go out and do an adult thing like buy furniture or electronics or laptops or motorcycles, whatever I want. I can do that. I'm an adult because the United States Armed Forces said that I was. But then come predators and creditors and businesses. They love servicemen and women. They love veterans, people are people who are serving. Because they know that one, you are locked into a contract with the United States military. And they know while you're in that contract, you are getting paid like clockwork on the first and fifteenth. And they will give you you could walk in empty pockets with lint in your pockets, and they're gonna give you something as long as you sign a paper that says you're gonna pay you're gonna pay them. Right? And they have this thing called a disbursement, a disbursement form. You sign that at the furniture store or wherever, with them, at the car dealership, or wherever, motorcycle shop. You sign that disbursement form. They turn that into our, our, com- our command where we work. And that authorizes the payroll department to cut a check to them before you even ever see your check. They're paying you, basically the Navy or the military, they're paying your bills for you. And when you get your check, it's already reduced. The money's gone. It's gone to that furniture store. It's gone to that car dealership. Your total check could be $2,000. But after taxes and those disbursements, many servicemen might get a check of 500 bucks. So you basically have money coming out of your account because you went from store to store, dealership to dealership. Some of you went and got an apartment. They can have you sign a disbursement form as well to make sure the rent's paid. And this was what I was in. I don't know if those rules have changed, but I'm just telling you what it was like when I was in the military. And don't forget, though, the military provides you with food and housing. If you're single and you want food and housing, they will never let you starve. And you will always, always, always have a roof over their head. I've seen uh, married couples separate and the soldier or the sailor will go back to the base and live on base. But of course, if you're married, you know, you want and need more and you get paid extra for that as well. For having children, for being married, for needing housing, for your family. They give you all that. All right. But then you learn to live on credit. And this is where it gets sticky. So not ever having credit before in my life, I go into the military and I walked in every walked into places. He says, you like that? You like that couch? You like that car? Here, take the keys. Take it for a spin. You in the Navy? Yes. Okay, well, go ahead. Take it for a spin. You don't have to pay today. We'll have you sign the paperwork. It'll be all taken care of. And they sell servicemen and women, high interest rates, buy a car, 25% interest, buy a house full of furniture, 30% interest. It's predator. These are predators. And I bought everything on credit. I became dependent on credit. Credit was like a drug. 
because I knew that I could walk in and see anything I want, whether it was an electronic store, ooh, that desktop computer is amazing. Give me that, write it up. Where's the disbursement form? And I signed it away, 24% interest. I became dependent on disbursements. Now, the problem is they paid my bills for me because of that form. I never had to worry about it. Just came right out of my check. Then when I got my check, like I said, everything was paid for and I got what's left, just like a nanny. All right. So when I got out, though, I had to do all of that on my own. But I still had that dependency on credit. So I got a civilian job. I was no longer attached to the military and I had to pay all my bills. And by the way, any disbursements that you sign, those places get notices that you are no longer property of the United States government. And all of, this, all the, all of those disbursements are trash, but they're still legal. And they will reach out to you and figure out how you're going to pay now. Some of them may give you a grace period. We're going to give you 30 days to get your shit together. Then your payments will start again, a deferred payment. <clears throat> so I was responsible for paying my own bills. You know, now I had to put a check in the mail because at the time there was like, there was no online payment systems or auto pay setups. Nope. You got the bill from the credit card company or the, the creditor. You had to write a check, throw it in an envelope, put it in the mail with a stamp. Boom. But if you're not careful and you don't have a decent wage to match what you made in the military, your financial life just begins to deteriorate. And there's so many veterans that don't consider this when deciding to get out of the military. I'm going to get out and get a job. Well, $50,000 in the civilian world could be equal 80000 in the military world because of all the benefits they give you. They give you health insurance. You pay a different type of taxes. You can eat at the cafeteria or the mess hall, wherever they call it these days. You could have housing over your head that you didn't have to pay for. Even if you were married, the, the, the military gave you money for you and your family to be housed. And so many veterans don't consider when I get out, if they try and get equal pay. Well, I made 80,000 in the military. So I'm going to come out and get 80,000 as well. It is not the same. So if you make less, can I sustain all of those disbursements that were coming out of my check and still be able to pay my rent? So oftentimes they just, people, military guys just stop paying them. They're like, I'm out. I'm no longer responsible for those bills. You know, the furniture store, the car payments, the bike, the computer, the electronics. Eh, I'm just not going to pay them. There's a lot of former military or veterans with really, really poor credit. That's how my financial life started. I always lived from behind and I lived walking uphill. And by the way, college graduates, they begin life pretty much the same way. When you're in college, credit card companies keep throwing you credit cards, credit cards, credit cards. And you pretty much got a pretty good credit score because maybe your parents co-signed for you on your college loans or you finally started paying them. You know, you got it deferred and they want you to get credit cards and credit cards. And then when you come out, you got twenty thousand dollars in credit card debt and also one hundred thousand dollars in um, college student loans. You're starting out life walking uphill. You're independent now. You can't turn to your parent and say, hey, help me. So you start out life with tens of thousands in debt. And you, you too, college graduate, can become dependent on credit. And I don't use the word dependent lightly. Because if you, could, if you believe in substance abuse and alcoholism and people that are addicted to things, you can become addicted to credit because it's just so, it seems so easy. So me personally, I had too much debt. I didn't understand taxes. There were some years I didn't even file um, or I didn't pay my taxes. Once I did file, I would get the bill in the mail. You owe $2,000. I didn't pay it. Um, <laughs> I just, and if I did get a tax refund, do you think I put that towards bills? No, I saw that as free money. I blew it on things. When I should have been paying debt, all the toys and electronics and clothes. Oh God. And I loved clothes and the bigger the name brand, the more I wanted it. I was, I was for it. So 
because I was just trying to keep up with the Joneses. And I, I, I was in the military. When I got out of the military, it was the hip hop area era. And so names like Tommy Hilfiger and Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Coach, they were big. Champion gear, Wu-Tang talked about champion gear that I rock and all that. Had to have it. My Adidas, Nikes, Air Jordans. That's the kind of crap I spent my money on. Um, so when you stop paying your bills, you can trick yourself into thinking that the creditors will, creditors will just forget about you. If you hide, ignore the letters, not answer the phone calls, you think they're just going to go away. And they don't. The calls just get more and more. So I don't know if you know this, but some banks will sell their um, debt to a collection agency. And the collection agency will buy the debt for pennies on the dollar. And the big banks, they will, they're, they're insured, so they get their money back anyway. So these collection agencies, they're, man, they're, li they're lions. Like, they pay those people that call you a commission for collecting a certain amount. That's why when you call to negotiate, they like, no, I'm going to get a commission on the $15,000 that you owe. And then you may be able to talk them down. Okay, you know, if you keep ignoring them or you don't agree with them, all right, Mr. Wright, let me talk to my manager. If I can get this down to $10,000 with you, will you set it up today for payments? And once you do that, they got the calls in you. Because once you set up your checking account for money to come out automatically to pay a, a, a collections agency, there's no turning that around. No way. And then the really aggressive creditors, they'll sue you and garnish your wages, especially the IRS. They can even seize your bank account and take everything that's in it. So I'll tell you a story. One day I was, I was, uh, I was rushing to work. I needed gas. I saw it on E and had been on E for like a day. I said, oh, I forgot. I got to go get that. I, I got to get gas. But since I was running late, I decided to go to work and get gas later. So when I left work that night, I pulled into the gas station, put my card into the gas pump, and it declined. I said, Whoa, see cashier. Go inside to see the cashier. And this was before pump and pay, pump now, pay later. This was like your card needed to either, to either work in the machine or you need to go inside and pay for your gas. A lot of gas stations are still that way. So I couldn't even start the, the gas pump. I go inside, see cashier. Hey, I don't know why. I knew I had like $1,800 in my account. So it didn't work. He says, I have an ATM over there. So I go to the ATM. It said negative $1,800 was in my account. Negative $1,800? That would make me have no money. Oh, my God. I got checks out there. It's too late. It's like eight o'clock at night. I can't call anybody. So the next day, I'm after multiple calls and sweat and panicking, I discovered that the IRS had took it all. I called the bank. They says, oh, your account was um, seized by the IRS and um, there's nothing we can do about it. You need to work it out with them. And they have to they have to release the seizure. Oh, my God. I got a job. How can I work? And I got outstanding checks that I had written. They're going to start rolling in overdraft fees everywhere. I literally had no money. I couldn't pay rent. I couldn't get gas. I couldn't buy a bag of potato chips. I might have had about $80 in cash to hold me over until I could figure this out. I literally went to the IRS office crying. I tried on the phone. I, had to, I showed up in person at my local IRS office. Please help me. Please help me. And at the time I had child support too. <laughs> and so I had to pay that. How was I to focus on anything with that weighing over my head? So, ladies and gentlemen, living like this is just pure hell. And I'm sure I'm not alone. There's some of you people out there who probably went through the same thing. But mentally and physically, it's depressing. And most of all, it's embarrassing. You can't tell people about this. Maybe in today's world, you probably, probably could. But back then, you couldn't. You just feel defeated. And unfortunately, many people become suicidal. And then you think the only relief from all this pressure is to file bankruptcy. And that's if you don't have a family that could bail you out. And a lot of people don't. But bankruptcy can be a huge relief. But I don't I don't even want to talk about it. I've done it. 
been there. So that was first step, file bankruptcy. Because the calls and the letters stop, it's a big weight lifted off your shoulder. It will affect your ability to get credit for a long period of time. But if you're credit dependent, don't forget those words, and you only know how to live on credit, this can be crippling, right? So I filed bankruptcy, step one. And But it doesn't relieve you from tax, tax debt. If you have taxes, you are either going to have to go to a tax relief company to help get you out of this. Um, but it can almost relieve you from debt from everybody else. And then once you feel that weight off your shoulder and you're free and clear, you'll say, I'll never do that again. I won't get myself in that situation. You have a clean slate. But just like alcoholism or drug dependency, you clean up your credit. Some banks are going to give you a credit card. And just like a drug, you start all over again. You start getting credit cards, small limits, $300. Oh, I got a $300 credit card. Then you get a $500 credit card. Then you get a $1,000 credit card. Then you go to a local furniture store and get that leather recliner. Oh my God, I could buy a car. You just, you start to cycle all over again. And then you get to the point where the job loss or <clears throat> changing jobs or layoffs, get fired. And you just say, what am I going to do? I got to pay my rent. So I'm not going to pay anybody else. And the cycle starts all over again. So I filed bankruptcy. So years later, after the bankruptcy, um, I had good enough credit to get back into debt. <laughs> and I got up to twenty dollars to $30,000 back into debt. I changed jobs and I couldn't afford to pay it. So I didn't. I knew how to do that. I had experience. So I just stopped paying the bills. This time I knew what to expect. I I wasn't in trouble with the IRS this time. Um, but this time I didn't file bankruptcy. I worked side jobs. I started DJing. I was working extra jobs that worked my way out of it. But again, I was in hell all over again. I had, I was going to say, I was just about to say that I had, didn't have money to go out and eat and entertain myself. But I did that anyway. I still did it. Um, Cause I'd rather go to the movies and spend $30 at the theater than pay a bill, I guess. So then down the road, of course, over time, I was able to buy a house and then I was in a bad marriage and that went sour. And then that was during the 2007, 2008 housing crisis, which means I overpaid for a house and I really didn't have the income or credit rating that I should have to buy a house. But of course, they were given anybody houses back then. So when that marriage went south, I was I was upside down on my mortgage and that breakup ultimately led to foreclosure. So now I got two. I got a bankruptcy in my on my resume and I got a foreclosure on my financial resume. Yay, I'm going for the trifecta. You ready? Here it comes. One day, my wife and I get up for work. At, my, at the time, my wife was a stay-at-home mom. Stay-at-home mom, took care of the kids. And you know, you always get your stay-at-home mom a minivan. So I got a car because I, I go to work every day, bought her a minivan. And one day we're getting ready for work, coffee's brewing, everyone's laughing, <laughs> playing. And then the tow truck pulls up in my driveway and takes my wife's car away. Car was repoed. So now I've had a, <laughs> a was that a bankruptcy? a foreclosure, and a repo. I am like, good, man. That is the trifecta. When you have all three of those things, no one can tell you anything about being in financial ruin. You almost can write a book, which I'm talking talking to you right now. So that was the final straw for me. Um, before, you know, my irresponsibility and immaturity affected only me. But now I have a family. And now it's affecting my wife and my kids. And that repossession, I'm glad it happened, honestly, because that was my wake up call. If I thought that I could keep riding this bad credit wave, financial irresponsibility, that was the one thing that said, wake the hell up, buddy. All right. 
And I got out of, I got through it through a few friends loaned me money. I was able to get the car back. Um, but I promised again, never again will I be in that situation. And thank God um, that I've become more financially responsible. I no longer have these credit abuse issues or problems because I think totally different. I'm a recovering credit addict. I own a house now. We have nice cars. My credit cards are under control. Most of them are at zero. I don't use them. I don't need name brands. I go to Old Navy, Target, TJ Maxx, Marshalls. I buy name brand clothes secondhand that's on the rack. Hell, I've even gone to consignment shops, bought sports coats and whatever. I'm just very frugal. I don't buy name brands. I buy Adidas, but I have a limit. I don't spend typically over $70 for a pair of sneakers. And that's a, that's a little bit compared to you guys out there spending $120, $150 for the New Jordans. Would I like to have that stuff? Yeah, but I'm, I'm not going there, man. I'm not going to get myself... No, because too many people rely on me. I got a daughter in college. I got another... I have an adult daughter who out of the blue sometime calls me and go, Dad, because she... She's growing up. She's learning. I can't pay my I can't pay my kids tuition in school or I can't pay my rent. Can you help me? And phew, you got it. Venmo her $150, $200. I can do that because I'm more responsible with money. I got a kid in college now who, although I say no a lot, and the reason I say no a lot, because I want her to be independent. But yeah. I'm I'm not fixed. I'm recovering. When you're a recovering addict, uh, alcoholic or an addict, it doesn't mean that you're cured. It just means that you've disciplined yourself not to be in those environments where alcohol is. You might drink, you know, I always laugh at non-alcoholic beer because if you drink a non-alcoholic beer, you're just doing it so you won't feel out of place in a group of people that's drinking beer. But also, if you drink a glass of Coca-Cola, they don't know if you got a rum and coke or what's in the glass. You might be better off doing that. Or club soda. I know people. I know people who get club sodas. Well, in credit, you can dress like you have credit. You can. I haven't bought a brand new car, like brand new, like current year, since probably like 2000. No, probably since like 95. Even when I was irresponsible, I still didn't buy new cars. I don't think I've ever had a new car. Everything's been two years older or more. Anyway, um, but even during the recovery period that I'm in, I've still financed furniture and vacation and cars. And I could see all this just trying to live the American dream. Don't need any of that shit. But it's the American dream, which can become the American nightmare. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, even though I've become more responsible, and I still would do things that don't make sense, like put a $5,000 vacation on a credit card with the family. And then I'm paying off that vacation for two years. But then I'm, I'm sorry, more than two years sometimes. And then at Christmas, I'd spend another $3,000, $4,500. And I'm paying for that. Christmas is to come. And you're just not catching up. And then I do a vacation all over again the next year. So I'm still got $2,000 left on the last vacation. And I just started a whole new bit. It is a hamster wheel, guys. I get it. I know what you're doing. That's why I won't go to Disney. There's no way I'm going to Disney and getting $15,000 in debt. And I'm certainly not going to save up to go to Disney when I could be putting that into my retirement. Mm -mm. Bye, Disney. Not happening. You know, and right now, at my age, I'm in my 50s, I've saved very little for retirement. Um, and I don't have, and I, I got financial investor friends, I'm sorry, financial advisor friends, and people who are really, really good with money, who think they can fix this situation. But I'm stuck kind of between a rock and a hard place that I want to live good, I want my family to live good, but at the same time, I need to save for retirement because I don't want to die and leave my family with nothing. I don't want them to have to sell the house. But right now, I've saved very little for retirement and I don't have enough saved that I, re I can retire in my early 60s or late 50s like a lot of people can because I've made so many mistakes in my 30s and 40s that 
it's cleanup time. And they, oh, pray to God that he allows me the time to get something in order to where it's sustainable for my family. So I'm working on that now responsibly, right? But I still live in fear. I live in fear every day. You know, my wife yelled at me last night. She goes, I hate talking to you about money. I'm like, I didn't even say anything because <clears throat> she doesn't understand the fear that I live in. I've been there. I know what I'm capable of. I know that, that if I, if I, I'm only any disability or terminal illness away, just one from us being destitute. And I'm trying to be responsible, trying to save money. Any disability in the near future that prevents me from earning a living that, that could cripple my family. An untimely death could affect my wife and kids for generations, even having an insurance policy. So I'm on a strong push, like to earn and save as much as possible this late in life. So I'm being transparent and vulnerable with you in hopes that you can change your habits now, today, so that you're not in your 50s feeling unsecured, protected. You're not putting your family and future generations in financial risk and ruins. I want you to spend better. I want you to be less dependent on credit. Save wisely. Speak to a financial advisor. Get your money in order. Make proper investments. Put into your, your employer's 401k and let them match it. And for God's sake, don't make stupid decisions. And don't go on vacations that you can't afford. And don't buy clothes that you shouldn't be wearing. I believe in living a debt-free life if possible. I believe in letting your income work for you and become your source of wealth. I believe in cutting credit cards and locking them away. And I had this discussion before. I know that people get credit cards for airline points and vacation and hotel points. And I know there's some people out there who's responsible to pay them every 30 days. Kudos to you. But that's not the majority of society. And I also believe in insurance to protect your loved ones. If you guys want to talk about this, I am very, very, very transparent. Very, I'll be very vulnerable with you. We can cry together, lie together, whatever you want to do. I just want you to get in financial shape in your 30s and 40s and 50s so that you aren't putting your family at risk and future generations at risk. Where I'm from, we call it breaking the cycle. You want to break the cycle. If that's what you're from, you can change that. Give me a call. Shoot me a text. Send me an email. Let's sit down. Thanks for joining the Happy Hour Weekly. I hope it wasn't too you know, doom and gloom for you. And I hope you had a good time listening to my headaches. And I hope you're out there calling me a dumbass because I'll call myself a dumbass. I was very irresponsible. And that's where we are. So hopefully I have a guest next time. You don't have to listen to me chatter for 50 minutes. I'll talk to you guys on the other side. Real Estate Happy Hour Weekly. Take care.